One afternoon, I ran across an ad in Rolling Stone that said, Drummer, available, will do anything. I called the guy on the telephone. Why don't you just come down and see me, he said. I'm playing at a club in Brooklyn, Saturday. By the way he spoke, his tone, his attitude, they were all bizarre. His name was Peter Criscola, and we shortened it to Peter Chris. Peter would run through the streets and go up to kids and demand their pocket change. The idea of a Jewish kid running up to you and demanding your pocket change is laughable. I remember that as a ten-year-old, every once in a while, I would have to run down the street to get away from the gangs and get safely inside the yeshiva. Peter liked to joke that he could have been one of those guys chasing the Jews. After one of our shows, Paul and I went to return the milk truck to the rental place. Peter had driven home. Ace was nowhere to be seen because he never helped us load or unload the trucks. After Paul and I finished the work, we had arranged to meet at two or three in the morning in Chinatown, where Peter was having a birthday party. Peter called for the waiter who came out of the kitchen and asked us what we wanted to eat. Hi, I'm Peter Criscola and I've got a nine-inch dick. At that point, Peter started making fun of the waiter to his face with this mock Chinese speech. What kind of fucking way is that to talk, he said. Please don't do that, we said. He's just trying to take the order. Peter blew up. Fuck you, he said. If you don't like the way I talk, why don't you just get the fuck out of here? Paul and I said, okay, if that's the way you feel, we will leave. Hey, Peter said, if you walk out that door now, I'm leaving the band. We looked at each other, shrugged our shoulders, and walked out the door. Peter was yelling all the way out. It was Lydia who talked sense into him, and he came back after two weeks. It was always about false bravado. The smallest dogs bark the loudest. Peter was actually the most volatile. As we were getting ready to play at the Diplomat Hotel, which was our first major coming out concert to the industry, Peter was depressed and threatening to leave the band again. I don't know, he said. I don't feel like playing. I'm not sure what I want to be doing with my life. Paul and I turned to Peter and said, this is for you. His face lit up. Now I feel like a star, he said. That's how it went all the time. The ship would start sinking, and Paul and I would plug the leak and keep paddling. The band was designed as a democracy. That was the blueprint. It was the Beatles model, but like the Beatles, it was clear that Paul and I were in the front seat and Ace and Peter were in the back seat. Whenever there were decisions, we made them democratically, which didn't always make sense. The truth was that Ace and Peter simply were not qualified to make decisions about band matters that depended upon organization and structure. We would have a meeting about a tour or a photo shoot, and the very next day Peter would come up to me and say, Gene, when are we going to have a meeting about the tour? We had it, I said. Yesterday. You were there. Yeah, he would say, but I didn't understand anything you were saying. Hotter than hell. In many ways, it was a continuation of the first album. And Peter was, as Peter has always been, deeply insecure about his role in the process. He wasn't qualified to make musical decisions. For all intents and purposes, he might have been tone deaf. There's one song on there, Strange Ways, that was written by Ace. And while we were recording, Peter insisted on playing a long drum solo. It was the kind of thing that bands like Led Zeppelin were doing, but mostly in their live shows. And Peter was no John Bonham. It just didn't work. When we heard it, we all thought it was ridiculous, and we insisted that it come off the record. Peter dug in his heels. If the solo went, he said, he would quit the band. This wasn't the first time he had given us an ultimatum, and it wouldn't be the last. Bob Ezrin was brought in to produce us. He was Canadian and had been successful with the Alice Cooper albums. Needless to say, we were fans of his work. We recorded the songs that Paul and I had written on tour. Ace and Peter also submitted songs, most of which were, at least in our estimation, not up to par. The ones that survived wound up being on the record, but rearranged and rewritten. Peter would get a songwriting credit when and if someone brought in a song, mostly finished, and he contributed a part. Beth was written by Stan Penridge, mostly. It was credited to Peter Chris, 
Stan Penridge, and Bob Ezrin. In truth, Peter didn't play a musical instrument, and I have never seen him write a single song. As a side note, Peter was having a hard time getting the vocal performance down. His pitch wasn't to Ezrin's satisfaction. Ezrin made the band leave the studio to give Peter a chance to concentrate. Beth is simply Peter singing alone. Destroyer also marked the first time we tried experimentation. Peter never counted bars of time. He had never done it and, in fact, didn't understand the fundamentals. Ezrin had to start from the beginning. Where was the one and where was the two? And then he had to teach Peter what a bar of music was, how long it lasted, and how one counted it. He also tried to crystallize what a chorus and a verse were. All this education made Peter very irritable. He has never been able to articulate his own playing, and to this day he doesn't know what a two or a four is. As a result, Bob Ezrin's time with the band was very tough for Ace and Peter, or at least that's how they saw it. Peter, in particular, was devastated by it. It was the same personality that made him threaten to leave the band if we didn't include his strange way solo back in 74. Peter was just too unpredictable. I had witnessed his unpredictability firsthand throughout our years together. For example, I found out that Peter and this woman who had become his second wife had been watching TV. Peter, for some reason, had his 357 revolver out. When an actor's face appeared on the screen and he heard his girlfriend had known the actor, he shot the screen. It wasn't the first time he'd done something stupid with a gun. When the band was on hiatus over the holidays, during Peter's first marriage, he shot the tree out from under his first wife as she decorated it. Kiss was on the covers of all the magazines, but it was often a solo shot only of me, and it was never Peter. This wasn't anything I planned. The press picks up on whoever they pick up on. When we did Kiss Meets the Phantom of the Park, we took two hours to put our makeup on. By that time, Ace and Peter were miserable. First of all, Peter had been involved in yet another car accident. He skidded 400 feet before he crashed, and he wound up in the hospital. When he did speak in the movie, he was impossible to understand because of his thick Brooklyn accent, so his voice was dubbed by someone else. Even the simple matter of getting Peter and Ace in front of the camera didn't always work out. The only solution was to use doubles. For Peter, we had a 55-year-old guy, and we put makeup on him. The solo project was unprecedented. No other group in history had ever released four solo albums simultaneously. After 20-plus years of sales figures, I'm at the top, slightly ahead of Ace, who is slightly ahead of Paul. Peter's sold the least well of the four. Peter didn't chart. Dynasty was recorded in New York City with Vinnie Poncia, who had been Peter's producer for his solo album in part to show Peter that we thought well of his record and to bring him back into the fold. By that time, Peter was our biggest liability because he had become dependent on chemicals. Peter was not qualified to make any judgments about material or arrangements. Peter was close to tone deaf and didn't play drums very well. Ironically, Vinnie decided that even though he produced Peter's record, he didn't think Peter was good enough to drum on a KISS record. Peter then got so upset, either with himself or with the way things were going, and I assume that the chemicals in his system had something to do with it, that he took his fist and smashed it into a glass case so hard that a shard went right through his hand. He had to be taken to a hospital and stitched up. Now there was a question whether there was even going to be a tour. What an idiot. Can you imagine being so upset at anything that you drive your fist through a glass case? Once we started working on Unmasked, it became clear that Peter's chemical problems had become major. We had a discussion with Vinny Poncia, and he said, Look, I don't want to use Peter on Unmasked. I want to use Anton Fig. The decision to use a different drummer on the album was just the first step in dealing with Peter. We honestly weren't sure what to do with him. 
Toward the end of the recording sessions, Poncia asked him to come in and add some harmonies on selected songs. They didn't go very well either. Peter had talked with Bill and Ace, and they agreed that he needed another chance, no matter the consistent torture he put us through. He wanted to come in and show how different he was. So we set up a meeting at SIR Rehearsal Studios in New York, and at the appointed time, Peter appeared carrying a music stand, the kind that symphony orchestra players have, with a clip for the sheet music. He looked very serious and intense. Peter couldn't read or write music, not then and not now. But by that time, he was so delusional that he thought if he had a music stand, he could convince us that he had changed. I'm surprised he didn't bring a baton. You guys, he said, I've completely changed my life around. I've been studying drums and music for the past six months, and I can read music. I'm completely better. I looked at the music sheets incredulously, and then at him. Can you read and write music, Peter? Sure, he said, then mumbled something, but I couldn't make head or tail of it. Then we started playing, and he was worse than ever. So after much deliberation, everybody, including Ace, voted him out of the band. We never said that Peter was thrown out of the band because he was a drug addict. We never said that Peter was close to tone deaf and didn't play drums very well. We wouldn't have done that to him, to the fans, or to ourselves. KISS had always been about the fans, and we had always been the quintessential American band, of the people, by the people, and for the people. So we needed a place where we could put up a suit-proof convention, a place where I didn't have to staff up and hire personnel to take care of parking, catering, and so forth. I contacted Tommy Thayer, the guitarist-songwriter from the group Black and Blue. I said to him, I'd like to offer you a job but I'm not sure what it will entail. It may start off with me asking you to get me some coffee. And if you're going to say I don't do windows, you better tell me no now, because whatever has to be done, including getting the coffee, is what you'll do. Tommy didn't even blink. He just rolled up his sleeves and said, okay, what do you want to do? I invited Peter to come down to the convention. Before the convention, we got together and rehearsed with Peter. He tried playing drums, but it was substandard. So Eric Singer decided to play the drums behind Peter while Peter just got up on a stool and sang. I looked across the stage and thought it was a real shame that Peter's other problems had prevented him from doing his best for the band and for himself. Direct communication with Ace and Peter was always difficult. Neither of them had people skills and they never answered their phones. Peter always had a roadie who would be his mouthpiece, and Ace always liked to have a manager or a keeper around him. For 15 years, I explained, we'd gotten along fine. We had made Kiss into a very big international band without makeup, without Ace, and without Peter. The only way we would even think about letting the two of them back in was under an employment agreement. We were not interested in being partners. If Ace wanted to come on board, We'd be happy to have him. We offered the same to Peter. Peter was so jubilant that for a minute I thought this tour might go smoothly. But it wasn't to be. Ace and Peter had become so crippled by their emotional problems and by various substances, they had become so diminished as human beings and as musicians that they would have been an embarrassment. Peter's drumming had deteriorated to an unacceptable level and he could not remember his parts. Though we had intense personal training sessions with weights and aerobics to prepare us for the concerts, halfway through his session, Ace would stop. Peter didn't stop, but every step of the way he complained that the guy who was working him out was too demanding. One of Peter's nicknames, for example, was Peter Long, because he was always complaining. He was also called the Ayatollah Chris Cola, and Mr. Misery. Now that the band had reunited and I was spending more time with Peter and Ace, I was starting to see the effect 20 years of heavy drug and alcohol use had had. Articles would appear about the band, and Peter would be furious at me. He'd come up and confront me and say, what the fuck did you say about me here? Before the interview, the reporter had written his introduction, 
and maybe he would mention that Peter had known drug problems or had been bankrupt. This was the writer's voice, not mine, but to Peter it was the same thing. When he got like that, he would team up with Ace, and he'd be back to the Peter who had tortured me from the beginning. Kiss was called upon to deliver another album to the record company. When I say Kiss, I mean Paul and me. We were the only real members of the band. Ace and Peter were not signatories to the contract. Bruce Fairburn, a producer who had been successful with bands like Aerosmith, Bon Jovi, and Loverboy, among others, came to meet with us in Winnipeg, Canada. We explained to him that it was going to be a nightmare. Needless to say, from the beginning to the end, he was tortured by Ace and Peter, who tried yet again to change the contract and didn't show up for most of the record. We had to use Tommy Thayer, Bruce Kulick, Kevin Valentine, and others in their place. The farewell tour kicked off in Phoenix, Arizona on March 11, 2000. People were crying in the audience. But maybe it wasn't because they were never going to see us again. Maybe it was because Ace and Peter were playing so badly. The misery of it was like pulling teeth. It became clear to me that the decision to make this tour the last one was not only smart, but maybe inevitable. Musically, it was the worst we had ever been. It was becoming very clear that physically, neither Ace nor Peter could endure too much more. As we were getting ready to embark on the Japanese and Australian leg of our farewell tour, Peter demanded a new deal. But we had a contract with him and weren't willing to meet these new demands. Peter held his ground and told us that we could take it or leave it. We left it. At the end of the day, Peter Chris is still the very same guy who, even before our first show at the Diplomat Hotel in 1973, a show where we scratched and clawed to get people there, was ready to quit the band. He went back to being the moaner, the nickname given to him by a former road manager. 